this temple. Let our praises fill this temple. Bibles to John chapter 5. That was on video. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody on video. Um, <laughs> you know, last week we had, uh, we had a, uh, every week is great. You know, what? one of the things that I, I love about uh, the way God works is when his word says where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is. Uh, he holds to his promise, doesn't he? I love the fact that God's presence is in this place every time we meet. And, and for some, maybe it's that intangible, it's just, it's just so different. And that's the thing is, elders that we talk about so often uh, is that we hear this from people who, who come in new all the time. They say, you know, there's just, I don't know what it was, there's just something different when we come there. And I'd like to say it's because the pastor is so handsome, um, but it actually has nothing to do with the pastor. It has to do with the fact that it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And God is always on the move, and God is always, always present, always doing things. But when we posture and position ourselves for God uh, to move, He does, and He shows up. And when we come together in prayer, or we come together in worship, or we come together to serve in the community, um, He is there in our midst every single time without fail. And I love that. And there are also those times where, where God will do just a little extra special something. I like to call it the PS at the end of the postcard, where at the end of a service or sometimes in the middle of a service or sometimes right smack dab in the middle of your day while you're driving to work or you're driving somewhere doing something, God will just show up and do something. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that today. Um, you may have heard me say this before, and for those of you that did the Experiencing God, have done the Experiencing God Bible study, um, we, have, we are so blessed to know that finding God's will um, is not complicated. And it doesn't take uh, a degree. It doesn't take uh, searching your whole life to try to find it, which, which is a mind blower for me because I, I spent the longest time thinking that God was holding his will and his purposes back and hiding them. And like only the special people get to discover what God is doing. Only the special people get to discover what God's plan is. Uh, and it was so freeing when we discovered years ago um, <clears throat> that discovering God's will is as simple as looking to see where he's at work and going and joining him there. And last week we had a, a, a great service and there was a, a moment in the, several moments, but a moment in the service uh, where God was already working and we just were, we just responded to what he was doing and we went and joined him in that and it was a good time. And God moved and things changed and people got touched and, and God was moving through, through the ministry of healing last week. And I believe, church, that for you and I, God wants us to continually be in those places where we are discovering what, what God is up to and we're going and joining him in that. And I've already kind of pre-preached my message, but I wanted to set you up today because I want to talk about what we do when the water is stirring. 
in John, well, let's just read it, and then we'll go from there. And don't worry, Pastor Sean, I'm not preaching, preaching your message. I'm using different points. John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there, was in, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. These lay a, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time, say a certain time, into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of water was made, um, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. That was a long time. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Wah, wah, wah. He answered them, he who made me well said, take up your bed and walk. Then they said to him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But, but the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being there in that place. After Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. We've explored this story uh, a number of times, usually specifically focusing uh, on Jesus' uh, healing and the way Jesus interacts. And uh, I've always found that this story is so interesting because it, it, it begins with this scene, and I love to picture this scene, a multitude hanging out in this area where there's this pool. And everyone has come there because they're expecting that somebody is going to get healed. Somebody is going to get touched. And if you missed it in the story, they're there waiting, and, and at a certain time, an angel comes and stirs the water, and right when the water stirs, the first person who gets in the water gets healed. So I just thought I would try that today. Holy Spirit's here. One person's going to get healed. It's the first person to the altar. You know, I've often, I've often thought, man, God, if you actually did it that way, I'd never have to beg people to get to the altar. They would be tackling each other. Then we'd have to have a healing service for those who didn't make it because they got run over getting up front. But here's this scene of these people who are, who are coming to this place. They're desperate. Obviously, a man who has had this ailment for years and years, over three, almost four decades Wow, anybody been around that long? That's like old. <laughs> He's been waiting. He's been waiting. I mean, that'd be like waiting there since I was a baby. Um, okay, I shouldn't lie from the pulpit. But there's this anticipation of people who are expecting something to happen, and they're just waiting. Okay, okay, today is going to be my day. Today, when the water gets stirred got my tennis shoes on, they're tied, I'm ready to go. And there's an expectancy for when the water gets stirred. Well, it's interesting. I've looked at this in a lot of different ways uh, over, over the years, but the, the name of the place, Bethesda, means house of mercy or literally place, house of flowing water. And if you think about what people were there for, they were there for mercy. They were there to get healed. And when the water would flow, their healing would come. And, and it may just be kind of a side note, and I just made some notes just on my own because I'm kind of a nerd that way. Um, but 
it's a, a pool with five porches or five coverings. And I don't know if you know this, but the number five oftentimes in Scripture is the number, uh, five is the number of grace. Grace is God doing something that you don't deserve. God doing something that you can't do, that you can't do on your own. And uh, this, this stirring um, is a literal stirring. The angel comes and stirs the water. But, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a, a, a spiritual shadow to so many things that we see in Scripture. And I believe that this stirring of the water um, is a shadow of this stirring of the Spirit. Now, it's interesting. Catherine talked about contrasts today between the Abrahamic covenant and the covenant with Jesus. And, you know, we, we have so many of these, of these uh, foreshadows. And here we have this pool that gets stirred. And when people come and they, they take the initiative to get into the, into the water, they get healed. And here's Jesus, the healer. Just kind of a, just not on my notes. All the angel is doing is coming and stirring what's in Jesus. I mean, healing comes from him. It comes from God. It's not the angel. It's not the water. It's not the stirring. It's not the pool. It's not the getting in. God is the one who heals, right? And so here's the healer standing by the pool of healing, waiting for an angel to come stir the pool of healing. And anyway, again, I'm just kind of nerding out over it. It's, we're not going to build a doctrine or anything over this. But here, here is this picture <clears throat> of people with this expectancy for something to happen and the, the pool to be stirred. And there's so many things I want to get to, and I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but here's Jesus, the one who heals, arriving at this place where people are waiting to get healed. And so we're going to talk today about what do we do when the water is stirred. And first and foremost, I just... I just want to go back to the phrase that I said at the beginning, is that discovering God's will or finding out what God's doing is looking to see where he's at work and going and joining him there. I believe sometimes we miss what God is doing because we're not looking. Or maybe we're not where the stirring is. Well, if God wants to move on my heart, he'll just meet me right here. Well, if God wants to do his thing, then he'll just come to me. And it's interesting, this man who's been sitting by the edge of the pool for all of these years, all these years, he's on the edge. He's on the edge, 38 years. I wonder what the odds would be, mathematicians. We don't know how many times the, the pool is stirred. Let's just say once a year, 38 times, what would be the odds of this guy being able just laying on the edge, stirred roll, stirred roll? I mean, I don't know about you, I would be practicing this in my head. In fact, I would probably be rolling into the water even before it was stirred, just in anticipation of getting healed. But see, there's something else going on in this guy where he just does not, he's come to the point where he does not have expectation. He's near the place of healing. He's by the pool with no expectancy. It never happens here. But I would suppose that it would be possible in some place, some other places, even in some other churches where, where people come Sunday after Sunday with the same affliction for 38 years and no expectancy. Or the same issue, the same thing, the same struggle, the same, the same stuff. Or maybe the same promise. Anybody have a promise from God? Nobody. These two do. Anybody else have a promise from God? You know, like a promise for breakthrough? Uh, maybe a promise for children? Maybe a promise for... Uh, for hope, maybe a promise for, a, for God to do something in your life. Maybe a promise for God to send you out to do something amazing. But you've been waiting. You've got a promise, and you've been waiting. Was there still just two? 
about a promise for healing? How about a promise for an attitude change? How he's been praying that mine would change for years. Where's your expectancy, honey? I got her flowers this week so I can push the envelope. Wait, let me put order, let me hit order on another order. I just have flowers in my cart for every time I mess up. I just, before I even, whatever comes out of my mouth, send before it goes. Expectancy. If you're taking notes, trying to follow the pastor. See, expectance, expectation causes us to look to see where God wants to work. Let me say this one more time. Being expectant to, and looking to see where God wants to work. Emphasis on God. See, in our human nature, we're looking to see where we want God to work. We're looking to see where we, we want God to come bless our plan, bless our program, do it in our timing, heal, it, heal the way I want to. And see, this guy with this issue for 38 years has an infirmity in his body but as you read the story, Jesus isn't concerned about his physical body. Jesus addresses what the real issue is at the end of the passage. Stop sinning so something worse doesn't happen to you. See, the guy, the, the healing of his body was the thing that God had him tripped up, but there was a thing in his heart that Jesus needed to touch. And see, there are so many times where God is wanting to work in a way that we don't expect, but we put him into the box of, well, this is my circumstance, God, so this is how you want to work. This is, this is my issue, God, and so this is, this is where we're going to have you work. And God's saying, okay, well, that's nice, honey, but let's deal with this. Let me do a bigger miracle. What's a bigger miracle? Healing your legs or healing a hard heart? Anybody ever have a hard heart? But what do we expect? Expectation causes us to look and see where God wants to work. Here's the thing. If we don't expect anything, we won't show up for anything. It's possible to be on the edge of the pool for 38 years and nothing happen. Uh, nothing happened in there. I guess I'll go to another church. Oh, nothing happened in there. I guess I'll go to another life group. Oh, nothing happened in there. I guess I'll go to another religion. Nothing happened in there. You get what you expect. If you expect nothing, you should expect nothing. But pastor, whoa, whoa, this is, I'm just putting faith into another term. The scripture says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I don't believe it's the size or the power of your faith that heals you, but you have to have faith. It's the size of the God whom you put the faith in. See, it's the expectancy in the one who's stirring the pool that motivates to be there, mo motivates us to be there. What is God capable of when he stirs the water? What could God possibly do? And see, sometimes we get so caught up in our routine and in our, our process and in, and in just the day-to-day the day -day thing or maybe even the church thing where we've just been doing the same thing for so many years where we come and we don't really expect something new. And so therefore, even when something new does happen, the water gets stirred and we stay on the edge of the pool. So we need to have an expectant heart. Secondly, we need to have desperation. Desperation positions us to be where God is at work. We need to look and see where he's working. Anybody desperate? Anybody like it? No, it's, that's why you're desperate, because you don't like it. And some would say, well, pastor, how could that be the gospel? God just wants you to be happy all the time. No, God wants you to be healed and whole and healthy and right with him. And sometimes you've got to, got to, you have to get a little bump on your head to get desperate so God will get you where he wants you. Our American Christianity is all about comfort, and God is not as concerned about your comfort as he is about your soul. 
and about your walk with him and your relationship with him and, and shedding the, the sins and shedding the complacency and, and, and shedding the apathy off of our lives. So sometimes, sometimes you're going to get a prod. Jesus speaking to Saul of Tarsus, isn't it hard to kick against the goads? What are goads? Like cattle prods, sharp sticks. Anybody kicking against a sharp stick? Get behind me, Satan. Sometimes the sharp stick is not Satan. Sometimes the sharp stick is God trying to get you desperate so you will get where the water is being stirred, where God is moving. And number three, our response. An angel went at a certain time. And see, I, I believe in freedom. I believe that Holy, the Holy Spirit will move how and whenever he wants to. But God is still a God of order and st- God is, still has his timing. And see, there are times where, where we miss what God is doing because we're expecting God to do it in our time. We're wanting God's time to come in and, and mold to our time and our expectation. But God, I want it now. And then when it doesn't happen in my timing, I go, oh, well, it must not be. Take up my mat, go home. Well, it must not be time. I wonder how many times the angel showed up at the pool and the guy was laying there and goes, eh, must not be time. Must not be. See, part of discovering what God is doing and discovering what he wants to do in your life and through your life and, and in the world around you is seeing where he's at work but discerning his time. And when it's time to get in, and, and by the way, human nature is when it's time to get in, we never want to. Anyone ever try to get your 12-year-old to take a bath? <laughs> Buddy, it's time to take a bath. I don't want to. No, really, it's time to take a bath. Well, we can laugh at that, but how many times is it God's time and yet we're not discerning the time because we, we develop apathy or, or in our own pride, well, I'm going to do this in my own time. I'm going to show up in my own time. You know, I shared this last week. We're talking about, or two weeks ago, we're talking about hearing from God. And sometimes God wants to talk and we decide to stay home that day. Or God wants to talk and we, and we, and we decide to fill our head with noise pollution rather than listening to what he's doing. And responding to when God is stirring the water is the same way. But this goes back to point number two. Am I desperate enough to be ready? Shoes tied. I'm ready to go. The water's going to get stirred, man. As soon as God moves, as soon as the altar is open, as soon as, worship, as soon as the first note of the worship team starts. But I don't feel anything. It's not about what you feel. Uh, but I feel funny. It's not about what you feel. I look funny. It's not about how you look. I don't really like this song. It's not about what you like. The water is stirring. I'm ready to die. I'm, I'm here. I'm ready to dive in because God is ready to move. But how many times, how many times are we waiting for someone else? And the man says, he makes this excuse. Every time the stool is per the stool, not the stool. Don't get in the stool. Ew. Every time the pool is stirred, there's no one to help me in. He makes excuses and blame shifts. There's no one else to get me in. Well, if the worship leader would pick the right song, I would enter in. If pastor, you would preach the right message, I would. If, the, if my life group leader would do the right study, if the prayer person would lift their hand the right way, and if maybe, maybe if they would speak in tongues a little louder, it would, what excuses do we use to keep us from going in the pool? See, desperation will get us out of that, but we have to choose. We have to make the choice, and we have to respond when God is moving instead of waiting for God to move when we want him to. Now, Just a little side note, God is always moving. God is always moving. But moving 
in that area or moving in that thing that we want God to, 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 to do in our lives begins with us being where God wants to move and doing what God wants to do first. And you know, it's incredible. It surprises me all these times, so many times when, when I have issues and things that I want God to deal with, and the moment I forget about my issues and I go join with, with God where he's stirring, suddenly my issues are gone. Suddenly my fears are gone. Suddenly my worries and my troubles, my challenges are gone. Why? Because I took my eyes off of mine, and God is capable of stirring this pool and working in another area. And by the way, Jesus healed this man's body (laughs) without kicking him in the pool. He healed his body without the man even having to do anything just to make a point. I'm not sure about you, but I would rather Jesus not have to make a point with me. And this brings me to the final one, and Catherine's going to come up and close us out today. The man gets healed, and Jesus says, see, you're healed. Pick up your mat and go. Pick up your, pick up your mat and, and get out of here. Go on to the next place. See, I believe, I've said this so many times, the greatest hindrance to the next move of God is the last one. It's how God did it last time. It's how God did it in me. Well, no, God only speaks this way, and prophecy only happens that way, and healing only happens like this, and, and the signs and wonders and the gifts of the Spirit, and all those things only happen this way. How does God talk any way he wants to? How does God work any way he wants to? He'll never contradict his character and his nature but he always does it differently. A crowd was around a pool because they knew that the pool is where people got healed. And one of the the people with the greatest afflictions missed the healer because he was looking at the water. He was staring at the way that it used to happen. He was staring at the way, and listen, that doesn't make it less spiritual, but see, there's sometimes where it's like, oh, that guy Jesus... No, this is where the spiritual thing is. No, this is, this, is where, this is where it's at, right here, because it happened before. And meanwhile, the healer is standing next to you going, can I heal you now? Can I heal you now? And then when we get in the water and we have that encounter and we have that moment, and Jesus' words are now, get up and go. Get up. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get off your mat. Don't go back to the mat. Go, don't go back to the side of the pool. That already happened. Well, but what if I need more healing? The healer will show up again another way, in another place. And this goes back to point one. I need to expect that he wants to and he's going to, to stir the waters. And I need to be ready. I need to be desperate for him. And I need to be ready to respond. And it all just happens Again, I respond, I get in the water, and then I need to get up and go. Okay, Catherine's not coming. Stand your feet. Hey, um, what Pat, I just, this is on my heart this morning, and it's just been stirring, (laughs) as we've been talking about stirring. Pastor is inviting us into this place. Alicia, can you go, is Alicia back there? Can you go to the response slide for me, please? Many of you... um, know this, before this carpet went down, there's a lot of declarations that are on this stage. They're written everywhere on this stage. There's hundreds of them. I want to invite us this morning to respond to what pastor is leading us into this morning. There's a place where we declared on this stage, many of you wrote expectancy on the declarations that you put on this stage. Many of you wrote what God was declaring over your families. Many of you wrote what God was declaring over worship in this house. All these different things. And we have to live a lifestyle that emulates responding to God in expectancy. Always. Not just Sunday mornings. What pastor is saying this morning is it can't just be this moment in time every single morning at 1030 at church. This has to be your lifestyle. This is what God is calling you to aligns us to God's timing. How many want to be in God's timing all the time, not just on Sunday morning at 1030? 
right? Worship's amazing. The word of God is amazing. But it has to be 24-7. It has to be your heart, your family, your declarations. You have to continue to be expectant all the time. And so this morning, I want to challenge us, and I want to declare right now that we are going to be expectant of what God is doing. Amen? Would you just close your eyes? I want you to just say this after me. Put your arms out, whatever you want to do. Posture yourself in front of the Lord right now. So, Father, we as a body, collectively, want to posture ourselves in front of you right now and just say this after me. God, would you make me more expectant? God, we're declaring your goodness over this place. God, I'm expectant of what you're going to do in me. And God, I want to align to your timing. Would you help me be expectant of your timing, God? Father, this morning, we stand before you. We're humbled by you. We recognize how amazing you are and how good you are. But God, we don't want anything else other than to align to your will. We want to align to what you're doing. We want to align to your purpose and to your perfect timing, God. Whether it's in this house or whether we're at Albertsons, or whether we're at the gas station, or we're at work, no matter what we're doing, God, we just want to declare from our hearts that expectancy, God. I want to stand in the stirring all the time. I want to dive into the water all the time, God, and I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to spend my whole life wishing I would have. So this morning, Father, we just declare that we are going to, with expectancy, go after everything that you put in front of us. With expectancy, we are going to align to what you want to do in your perfect timing. We might not like it, and, but God, I want to be desperate. We want to be a desperate people so that no matter what, we are always pointing people back at you and back at the word of God. Because from the word of God comes life and comes perfect timing and comes alignment. And so, Father, we just want to respond from our hearts this morning.